There are thousands of people online, including me, who will tell you that the X100V is the best camera that they've ever used for photography. But I've always been curious about the video features of the camera. On paper, it looks really great. It shoots 4K, it can shoot 1080 in up to, I think, 120 frames a second. You can shoot log on it. It's got loads of features that you would find in a professional video camera, but I never really see anyone talk about what it's like for video. So I thought I would head to the skate park with my friend and shoot a little BMX edit with the camera and one, find out what it's like to shoot with and two, see if we can get some really nice cinematic looking footage from the camera. So one of the first problems that I had straight away was the fact that the X100V doesn't have any inbuilt body stabilization. I didn't realize how much I relied on this on my Sony cameras until I started trying to film without it on the X100V. It was pretty horrible. So. I had to balance it on my Ronin SC2 gimbal, however the camera isn't really heavy enough for it so straight away I started having issues with the gimbal. I found that putting the wide conversion lens on the X100V added a little bit of extra weight and it just helped to balance the gimbal but yeah this was a bit of a problem. The gimbal was just shaking and it just wouldn't balance properly and it was a bit of a nightmare. Speaking of lenses, I decided to take two extra things with me, the wide conversion lens and also this kind of secret weapon lens that I'm going to do a video on in future, which is basically a fisheye lens adapted to the X100V. So if you want to see more about that, hit the subscribe button because there's more info about that coming soon. It's pretty cool that you can use the built-in film sims while you're filming and you can even input data from like recipes and stuff like that so you can change all of the kind of the colour and the tone curve and stuff. However, I didn't find a way that you could use like the ones that you'd already saved on your camera, so you would have to put in all them settings again when you choose to film in mode. This is not really a huge issue, but it's a little bit of an inconvenience. However, I knew that I was going to be grading my footage afterwards, so I decided to shoot F-Log. I didn't really know what I was doing with F-Log, I've only ever shot S-Log on Sony cameras, so I assumed that it was kind of like the same and I just shot as if I was shooting S-Log. A couple more issues I ran into while I was filming was that the autofocus is terrible. I wouldn't usually mind, but with my camera being on a gimbal, I was kind of relying on it, but it really is awful. It kept going in and out of focus. The focus motors were noisy. And to be honest, manual focus on this camera is just pretty bad. There's not a lot of feedback on the manual focus wheel. It's quite hard to get in focus. I was using peaking. It's really good that it has peaking otherwise it'd be impossible especially when you shoot in log and the image is very flat. But yeah I just found the whole focusing manual or auto just a really awful experience. The 4k is really nice and sharp out of the camera. The colours look beautiful as is to be expected with Fujifilm cameras. Having an ND filter built into the camera is absolutely amazing. I wish more cameras had this. I know the Sony cinema cameras have this, but that was really handy just being able to click that on. Um, I did notice, however, though, when the aperture was wide open shooting in daylight, it wasn't enough to keep my shutter speed at 1 60th. So I did have to stack it with my ND filter. I have an ND8 filter, which is, I think it's two stops. When I stacked it with that, it was fine. When shooting in 4K, the camera got pretty hot, but it never really overheated. Um, I was never really shooting for more than like 20 seconds though, so I would worry about it if you were shooting something that was like 10 minutes long. I do think that the camera might overheat because it was getting really, really hot, but that wasn't an issue for me. It's really nice to have the ability to shoot slow-mo on this camera. Um, in 1080 HD, you can shoot in 50 or 60 frames a second, which means that if you were shooting on a 25 or 30 frames a second timeline, you can slow it down by half, which is pretty cool. It also has the ability to shoot in four times slow-mo, which is technically 100 frames a second. However, it's cropped in, and also when you put the video file on the computer and you play it back, it will play back in slow-mo. It's not like some cameras where they will shoot 100 frames a second and the video will be in normal speed. This automatically slows it down to four times slow-mo. Overall, I would rate the filming experience with this camera as not very fun, but let's jump into Final Cut, have a look at the footage and see if we can make it look great. For colour grading today, we're going to be using the film emulation software Dehancer. For full transparency, Dehancer have sent me the software so that I can make this video. However, I'm not getting paid any money to do it and they don't get to see this video before it goes out. So all of the opinions that I'm going to say about the software are my own, good and bad. Okay, so here are our clips in Final Cut Pro. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a letterbox to the footage. And then I'm going to add an adjustment layer over the top. 
and I'm gonna put Dehancer Pro on top of that adjustment layer. Let's make this a little bigger so we can see what we're doing. Okay, so straight away, it looks pretty awful, but what we need to do is we need to go on source and choose our camera. The X100V is not actually a choice on this, but the X-T3 is, and it uses the same sensor. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick that and select F-Log. And straight away, we can see that our footage looks about 20% nicer. Now, one thing that I noticed straight away with Dehancer is that it adds an absolute ton of grain to the footage. If we zoom in, we can see it just obliterates the footage with grain. I really like grain, but this is just too much. We're gonna scroll down and take out most of the film grain. So first things first, we need to pick a film profile. We click on this drop down menu here and it gives us a absolutely massive list of different film stocks. These range from stuff like Cinestill to Kodak Ektar. We got Kodak Gold, we got Portra. You can click through these and have a look. There are loads and loads of different looks. And apparently they were really great likeness of the actual films. I think they're scanned from the films or something like that. But today we're gonna pick Kodak Aerocolor 4. We also have the option to push or pull the film. This typically in film would be done by underexposing while you were shooting and then developing for a longer amount of time to make up for it. Here, we don't need to do that. We can shoot at the right exposure and then use this push-pull slider to get different looks. I'm gonna leave this somewhere around here. Now, the second thing we need to do is because our footage still looks quite washed out, we need to mess around with the black and white point of our footage. To get really accurate with this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the bottom, we're gonna go monitor, and we're gonna select clipping indication, which will basically put red marks all over our footage where it's overexposed, and it will put blue marks on the footage where it's underexposed. So now we're gonna adjust the black and white point to a point where they're both not clipping. That'll do nicely. We're gonna take that off and we're gonna go back up here and we're gonna have a look at these different tabs. First off, we got film developer. Here you can make adjustments to the contrast. You can make adjustments to the gamma. We also have this color boost slider, which is a lot like saturation, but it keeps all of the colors inside the color gamut. Moving down, we have film compression. One of the great things about film is the dynamic range that it gives you. This little section here basically kind of gives you a more analog looking dynamic range to your footage. We can also increase the range of tones in our footage. And we also have this color density slider, which apparently makes the saturation look more like negative or positive film. A zero value will make it look like negative film and a hundred value will make it look like positive or slide film. So onto the print section, here we have a couple of different choices. So we have Cineon Film Log. Um, this makes it all super log. I'm assuming this is probably handy for something, I don't know what, but I don't like the way it looks. We have Fujifilm Print Film, we have Kodak Print Film, and we have Kodak Endura Glossy Paper. I think I like the look of Kodak 2383 Print Film, so I'm going to go with that. We also have some controls on this, so this controls the white balance of the film. We can also adjust the exposure here. This doesn't blow out the highlights, so it's really good if you've underexposed your footage for correcting that. We've got tonal contrast, which adds or takes out contrast. We have color density, which again affects the saturation in certain colors. And we have the overall saturation of the print film. We also have an analog range limiter, which further increases the dynamic range. On second thought, I think I actually like the Kodak Endura Glossy Paper version of this. Next, we have Color Head. This is kind of like color grading. Uh, I think it's to do with like the print heads of when you're printing on the film. I'm not 100% sure, but I kind of like to tint my film a little bit green. We also have what is effectively a temperature adjustment for the shadows, midtones, and highlights. Film grain is pretty self-explanatory. There are loads of different types of film grain we can add on this. We can make adjustments to the shadows, midtones, and highlights. And there's also a film resolution slider, which keeps or gets rid of detail in the film. For example, if we put it on 100, we retain a lot of the detail. And if we take it down, it kind of blurs the footage a bit which is quite reminiscent of stuff like Super 8 film. We can also change our grain from negative to positive grain. Positive grain is a little bit more subtle and negative grain is a bit more kind of in your face grainy. So moving on to what is undoubtedly my favorite part of this plugin, the halation and bloom sections. So for anyone who's ever shot Cinestill film, you will know that one of arguably the best things about it is the halation, which is the red part that occurs between high contrast areas. This plugin basically gives you the option to add that. 
So it's quite subtle and I feel like it works best when it's quite subtle. But you can see here between the wheel and the sky that we're getting this sort of red bit here. We can turn the local diffusion up and make it more intense. I think this works best when it is subtle. I feel like it can be very easily overdone, but used sparingly, it really does give a nice filmic look to your footage. There are loads of different controls that you can do with this. You can change the hue of it. You can make it more orange. And you also have the option for global diffusion, which just adds a huge red glow all over your footage. Personally, I think it's way too far, but Use sparingly, again, it could look quite nice. And lastly, we have the bloom section, which is essentially just a promised look for your footage. So if we add this, you can see here, um, if we turn it on and off, it's adding like a nice glow to the footage. You can make this really intense, or you can turn it down and make it quite subtle. You can change the amount of diffusion on it, limit what glows and what doesn't. So for example, if you just want the lights to glow, you can have that. Or if you want everything that's bright to glow, you can turn it down and it will basically just glow everything. And then you have a master impact slider that can just reduce the whole look. You also have a vignette section, which adds a vignette. You have film breathe, which adds very subtle exposure differences to each frame to replicate how film would be. And you have gate weave, which zooms in and out very slightly also to replicate film going through a projector roll. So overall, I'm very happy with how this is looking. I could spend hours just going through here and messing around with little different things. And I feel like they really have done a very good job at replicating film. It's definitely worth noting that the Fujifilm only shoots 8-bit. If you have a camera that shoots 10-bit like the Sony a7 IV, uh, you can do a lot more with the footage. You can grade it a bit better. It doesn't fall apart as easily. And you seem to get a lot more dynamic range with the Sony footage. Here it is over some shots I took at Outbreak. I feel like these look absolutely amazing and without Dehancer, that was probably not a good frame to stop it on. Without Dehancer, these just look like normal S-Log so you can see the difference that literally just 60 seconds using this app makes. So let's see if Dehancer can make the X100V look cinematic. Something that I would like to see in future versions of this plugin is the ability to scale back the film profile amount. Some of them, as you can see, are pretty intense and you might only want a little bit of that look and not so much the whole thing. You can go down to the bottom and you can change the output of the entire thing, but this also changes the output of all of the other adjustments that you've made on it. Sometimes I would like to add a film profile in and then dial it back, but still keep the intensity of all the adjustments. Now I can't talk about this product without talking about the price. The price is quite expensive. For a lifetime subscription, it's $449, or for a year, it's $299. They've given me a discount code, which is Eddie 10 that you can use at discount, and that'll give you 10% off. And also, if you wanted to save a bit of money, you can get the light version, which is basically half the price. You still get the film profiles, you get the bloom, you don't get the halation, which is a bit of a shame, but I do think everything you get here is enough for most people. I know for a fact I've spent more than $449 on a specific lens before, that I can only use like 5% of the time, 
This is a plugin that I could use all of the time. So in the grand scheme of things, I do think it's worth the money. However, for a lot of people, it is a lot of money. As mentioned a minute ago, you can enter Eddie 10 at checkout for 10% off your order. It's also worth mentioning that Dehansa have an iPhone and iPad app. I think in some ways this is better because you can also edit photos in it as well as video. So unless you are a professional video editor, this might be a better choice for you. The app has all of the same tools and film profiles as the desktop app, but it means that you can do stuff like editing your Fujifilm JPEG files, or just editing photos that you've taken on your phone, as well as videos. Just like the desktop app, it uses all the same film stocks, so what you're getting is a true representation of how the film looked. So my final thoughts on the X100V4 video is that it's just not that great. You can get some really nice footage out of it, but the experience of shooting with it isn't very fun and it has quite a lot of limitations. For example, the autofocus, the manual focus. I think that if this was the only camera that you owned and you wanted to make a video, you could do that with it. But if you wanted to shoot video for work or anything like that, or you were really passionate about shooting video, something like a Sony A6500 would be so much better and probably cheaper with a lens so i would definitely go with something like that versus this thanks so much for watching i'll see you in the next one